May we pray. Thank you, Father, for the privilege of once again gathering in your house on this your day. We pray that we will learn something here, that we will rightly divide the word of truth. We'll learn how to serve you better. We pray for your people around the world, wherever they are, that you will give them power. For it's in Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Amen. Luke 3, verses 1 and 2. Luke is a writer that wants you to understand some details of history. Remember that the Gospels are not a modern version of a history. They're the story of Jesus, the story of the Gospel. But Luke gives you the time. And here's the way Luke described it. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod, the tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, the tetrarch of Iturea and Trachonitis, and Lysanias, the tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah in the wilderness. He went into all the country around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And I've got a note here at the bottom of the picture and that is that the Herod he's talking about is Herod Antipas. Some people call that Antipas. Uh, anti means old or before. And uh, his grandfather was named Antipater, they, they call him. Uh, really, it's Antipater, which means the old father. And that was Herod's father. And then this is Herod's son, one of them, one of many. And then this Annas was the high priest emeritus. Well, what is that? Well, the high priesthood had, uh, in some people's eyes, become corrupted. And so you had Annas that was a high priest a while, and he was removed. And so he got his son put in there. And then he was removed, and another son was put in there. And I think, I don't remember whether there were two or three sons but when he ran out of sons, he had Caiaphas put in there, his son-in-law, who was married to his daughter. And so Annas is the high priest that Jesus was tried before, and so was Caiaphas. And so you're dealing with two different generations of priests, and John, uh, Luke is telling you about that. Now, I thought I would throw that scripture in there today and comment on it in that there are plenty of criticisms that have been raised about the gospel and the gospel story the gospel writers the gospel books the writings and uh, Luke is the one that gives you dates, times, places and uh, talks about the government and, and uses names of officials and so forth and, and there's been an effort over the centuries to prove him wrong, and I don't think that it can be said that anybody ever succeeded in saying that Luke was wrong. And so there is the time frame, the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar. And you can track that out in history, and you can know exactly when that was. Luke chapter 3, 15 to 20. And this 
is about the ministry of John the Baptist. The people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Messiah. What was this about a Messiah? Where did that come from? Well, it came both from the Old Testament and from other writings that are not in the Old Testament. And some of those writings that are not in the Old Testament spelled it out what their expectation was in a whole lot clearer words than what is in the Old Testament. In other words, they had an expectation that meant that they had it all figured out what the Messiah was going to be like. It's kind of like uh, that was that the story of Cinderella where they had this shoe and they were looking for somebody that would fit it? Well, they, uh, they had an expectation of Cinderella and they were looking for somebody that would fit the shoe. And John, in verse 16, John answered them all. I, what, dip you with water or I plunge you with water or I baptize you with water. But one who is more powerful than I will come the straps of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Wow, that's different. What does, what does that word actually mean? He baptizes you with fire. He baptizes you with... with uh, I, I, I have given that some thought, and I'm not sure that, that I can rightly answer it. But it, you had a Sunday school lesson this morning if you were using the same literature that I was about those uh, people on the Emmaus Road. You had two disciples on the Emmaus Road and, uh, and I have taught a class here with you calling attention that Jesus in the way that this thing worked out and according to God's plan, Jesus had to train these disciples to take his place in the world and to do the job of uh, bringing in the kingdom of God according to the way that Jesus taught. And, and the, the concern from the beginning was that they would misunderstand and this expectation of the Messiah that they had was a misunderstanding of how God was going to do it through Jesus. They misunderstood and they refused to the last minute to understand. And that's why when they went to the tomb, they were so amazed. He had told them how it was going to happen. And they did. John is the one that tells them. He said, until we saw the empty tomb, we didn't believe. He's talking about him and Peter. Hunter, Hunter, that, that man who comes later who baptizes with the Holy Spirit and fire, that happened on the day of Pentecost. They were baptized with the Spirit and they had tongues of cloven fire on their heads. So that, uh, you know, what John is talking about is it's still an action of Christ, but it's after he's gone to heaven, then he sends the Holy Spirit and the fire to confirm these people and give them power. Yes, that is a fact of the scripture. Now one fellow said, one theologian said that that word fire meant judgment. Judgment. Yes. He's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with judgment. Does that, does that fit in? It's not something that I've got worked out where I can sit here and give you the answer, but the, the answer that I was going to give you is this. In today's lesson, you have two disciples that were quitting the fight. They were going home to Emmaus, and Jesus walked with them. And the line that they told after Jesus left them was, didn't our hearts burn within us? Now, it's true that there, that there were tongues of fire on them at Pentecost, but it's also true, and this is how it affects us, and that is that when we get into this, that your heart 
We'll catch on fire. Is that right? Yeah. That, that's how I think it applies to us. I've not seen anybody that was saved and tongues of fire came down on them. That's not what happens now, sir. The fire also means to purify, don't it? Well, of course it does. Okay. Yeah. But the thing about it is, you know, somebody who gets saved, they get the Holy Spirit at that moment. Well, for a day or two, they're on fire. They're telling the gospel everywhere they go. That's until right. Satan squashes them down. Till the realities of this world come through. It's hard to latch on to the realities of heaven since we haven't been there. We haven't seen it, and it's and it's more of, of a hope than something that we've got in our hand. John answered them all, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I will come, the straps of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And I call your attention to the word powerful there. And I believe that the essence of the Holy Spirit is power. And I'll have a class on that coming up. But I can't cover everything in one night. But this word power. Jesus talked about the power of God when he was talking to Nicodemus. He used a word for power when he said you've got to be born again and so forth. I'll get into that. But we are saved by God's power. And when you're talking about power, fire not only is a cleansing thing, but uh, it is the source of of power that we use to propel the world today, is it not? You all know of any power really that we've got that's not based on some form of fire? His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his thrashing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn. But he will burn up the chafe with unquenchable fire. Well, what is a winnowing fork? I decided tonight that if I get down to it, I'm gonna show you some pictures. And I've got pictures of all of this, including the winnowing of wheat. But basically what they did is that they cut down the wheat with a, a sickle and gathered it into sheaves and put it on the thrashing floor and had an animal pull a, a drag around on it till it kind of broke the grains away from the husk and then the wind blows like West Texas and the winnowing fork they pitch it up in the air and let the wind blow the chafe that away downwind and so the grain falls back in a pile and the chafe blows over there and so it says that his winnowing fork is in his hand this is a an illustration of what Jesus was gonna do that they could understand. And, and one thing that I notice about the way this is written is that Jesus and John and, and the others used illustrations to illustrate what they were talking about and they used illustrations that were common to common people. And with many other words, John exhorted the people and proclaimed the good news to them. The good news, of course, is the gospel story. But when John rebuked Herod the Tetrarch because of his marriage to Herodias, his brother's wife, and all the other evil things he had done, Herod added this to them, that he locked John up in prison. Well, this shows you that everybody understands that if the Messiah had gotten into politics, he would have had to face what John faced. Now John had no army to protect him. Well, I'll get into the temptations of Jesus and the devil really 
told him, you need an army to protect you. Well, John baptizes Jesus. At that time, this is Matthew 3, 13 and 15. At that time, Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. Do y'all find that an interesting phrase that in the synoptic gospels we're given Jesus in Galilee? Well, what is this came from Galilee to the Jordan? Well, that's not in Galilee where he was baptized. But John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Well, it, I, I think I remember that it says that John was baptizing in the wilderness of Judea. And so that's where Jesus went from Galilee to be baptized. And John says, I need to be baptized by you. And Jesus said, let it be so now. Y'all get the significance of the word now? I mean, you have in the New Testament that now is the time of salvation. There's a time that uh, in the Gospels you have this phrase that was used time and again where Jesus said, my time has not come. And then you have an incident where the Greeks showed up and said we would see Jesus. And if you'll read it, you'll see that after that, the time had come. Let it be so now, Jesus replied. It is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness in this way. And then John permitted him. And I have said in this class that this is how Jesus really joined humanity. It's not only that he was born of woman, as the scriptures repeatedly say, but he made a choice to join us. And we are baptized, symbolic of joining him in his death. And when he was baptized, he symbolically joined us in our death. And he did die. The, the gospel story is that the one who was the son of God died. And that is one of those scandals of the gospel that they held against those who would spread the gospel. They said, this is a bunch of foolishness. It doesn't make sense. You can't kill a God. And you guys say that this one was killed. And not only that, he didn't die in battle. He was tried as a criminal and hung up on a cross in the worst possible criminal sentence that could be I mean, he did something bad, or they wouldn't have done that to him. The government did that. Yeah, they did. We, uh, we have this information about Jesus' younger years that he grew. What? This man was the son of God, and he had to grow? Oh, the only explanation I can give you is that the eyewitnesses gave you this and they gave you an account of him growing. And here's one thing that happened, and that is that, that they went to the Passover feast down at Jerusalem when he was bar meets far, around 12 years old. And after three days, after looking for him, they, they were on the way home and they thought he was in the caravan and they started looking for him, and after three days, they found him in the temple courts. He's still back there at Jerusalem, even though they left, sitting among the teachers, listening to them, and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me, he asked. Don't you know I had to be in my father's house? Well, you have some texts in here about him cleansing the temple. And he talked about this same idea that this is my father's house. But they did not understand what he was saying to them. 
I could get into the history of this discussion and I don't know that it's appropriate for, for me to just get into all the details, but one of the things that the church argued about was who was Mary, and they finally adopted a uh, statement that said that she was Theodakos. And uh, that means Mary, mother, the, the mother of God. And if she was the mother of God, then she wasn't like the rest of us. Well, according to this right here, she may have been awfully much like the rest of us. It said that his parents were astonished and his mother got on to him. Son, why have you treated us like this? And in verse 50, it says they didn't understand what he was saying to them. Well, it's true that she was the mother of God, but that doesn't mean that she was superhuman in my opinion. Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. Well, the people in Nazareth, when they heard him later, they said, this is the son of the carpenter over here. We know him. And they knew that he was obedient to his parents. And y'all were saying, this is the son of God? Well, I don't have the answer to all the mysteries about this. I, I have spent a lifetime learning the questions. The answers is harder. He was obedient to them, but his mother treasured all these things in her heart. Well, some of these stories, you remember Luke said, I have interviewed the eyewitnesses. Well, I think he interviewed this one. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Now that alone sets him apart from most of us. Uh, how many people do y'all know that grow in stature with both God and man? I'm telling you, the closer we get to God, the, the more enemies we seem to have among men and so forth. That sure happened to John. So in Matthew 3 and 4, Matthew gives us his account of the Jesus Galilean ministry beginning. And he talks about John be baptizing Jesus. And I've got a note here that's not scripture, it's my note. Do you all understand there's a difference between the notes in the Bible and the text? I call your attention to the difference. And what you're looking at up there is notes. It's not the text. Jesus committed himself to saving the world. That's my opinion of what the baptism is. It is he committing himself to us. When we're baptized, we commit ourselves to him. That's how we meet So God made an announcement, a voice, to take it here. And the disciples heard it. And then Jesus entered the temptation. He entered it. He resisted it. He endured it. Special temptation. Well, why is that? Why do we read? Then he comes to John, and he gets baptized, and then the Spirit leads him off into the wilderness to be tempted and it lasted 40 days. Isn't that a curious thing? That's one of those questions that I can ask. I'm not sure I have all the answers, but I have gathered up some answers. And so these are my notes. Note, God's power is given to those that God trusts. It's given in trust. And here's a statement that I, whenever I say it, there's people that say, oh, no, that can't happen. But I say that when we receive God's power, we have the free will to either use it or misuse it. Y'all ever seen a church busted up because of misuse of God's power? 
Y'all ever seen a reputation of a Christian ruined because there was a misuse of God's power? Jesus, you see number four there? Jesus never misused God's power. Jesus never violated God's trust. The temptation, and by the way, uh, Matthew and Luke are the only ones that give you the temptation in the three forms that we have it. And the order in Matthew, and that's the one I'm going to follow here, the order in Matthew is slightly different from Luke and the two. <laughs> Uh, put the vision of all the kingdoms of the world as the second and Matthew put it as a third temptation. That's just a question. That's not an answer. But the first temptation in Matthew, and this is my interpretation of what it was, is to misuse God's power over creation for his own hunger. Jesus would use his power to help people and to feed them. And he would eat with people. He would fellowship with people. But he would not use the creation power for his self, for himself. He used it for others. You ask, why all of these miraculous things? Wasn't he showing off God's power? Well, there's another side of that, and that is that he had the power. What was he going to do, walk around and see all these hurting people and do nothing for them? He had the power, and he loved them, and he helped them with miraculous power. So what that lead to? Well, we'll talk about that. But Jesus would not misuse the power over creation for his own hungering. The second temptation in Matthew is to misuse God's power over angel armies for his own salvation. Well, I, I think I've already read you that John was cast into prison for offending Antipas, King Antipas, and he had no army to protect him, and so he lost his head. And so here Jesus is being tempted to use God's army to straighten out the world and to bring in the kingdom. Now, there's a lot of ways of saying this. Here's one. In the decision of how to bring God's kingdom, and, and this temptation here is Jesus dealing with the temptation to bring it other ways than, than uh, the way it was brought. I mean, is that what the temptation is? A chance to do it another way? All right. This, this is the question here about this angel armies. Are we going to bring the kingdom of God from the top down or from the bottom up in the world? Now, what, what did I just ask you? Well, bringing it from the top down is means that we use an army to take over the government and we tell everybody, and Mohammed did this, and... The conquistadors down in South America did this. They uh, went to those people and said, uh, you can submit to this religion or we'll kill you. And that's bringing it from the top down. Jesus wasn't going to kill anybody. If anybody was going to be killed, it would be him, not anybody else. Jesus brought as far as I know, the only kingdom that's ever been brought on the face of this earth by the blood of the king instead of the king's enemies. Which kingdom was ever established without shedding somebody's blood and it was always the other side? In this kingdom, there was no blood shed on the other side. It was shed by the king's blood. That's new. That's bringing it. Well, I haven't yet explained the difference between the top down and the bottom up. The top down means that you make a war. From the bottom up, 
means that you deal with people, whoever they are, wherever they are. When John the Baptist was in prison, what did he send word to Jesus and ask him? He said, are you the one we were looking for or another? And what he was saying is that I haven't, you haven't rescued me out of this jail. You haven't sent your troops down here and captured this fort. You haven't done any of that. Are you the one that I'm looking for? See, even John had questions that were unanswered. And what did Jesus answer? The lame walk, the blind receive their sight. He didn't say, we have avenged you with the king. He didn't say none of that. He said, I'm helping people that are common, unimportant people that, that are not rulers of the world. I'm, what, building it from the bottom up. I mean, that's why we can expect to get saved. How many of y'all are the governor of a state or the president of a country or a king or somewhere? No. All of us are just folks, and we can get saved because of Jesus' choice to turn the world upside down and build a kingdom instead of from the force down, he used power from the bottom up. Y'all hearing that? The last temptation that's in Matthew was the temptation to misuse God's power over the earth to just make himself the ruler. Well, the real temptation in all of that was to betray God's love for the world. What, what did Jesus tell Nicodemus? God love the world and I think the word Greek word is edokin <coughs> what is that it means gave God gave that, that doesn't say that God sold or that God sent an angel army to wipe out everybody that was doing wrong if he'd have done that who would have survived it? Well, Jesus would have been alone on the face of the earth. The temptation was to betray God's love for the world and join Satan's kind of rule. And Satan's kind of rule is to take the world from the top down by force. It's light versus darkness, truth versus Versus betrayal. Do you know, and I haven't really explained this in my classes, but, but in the New Testament and in New Testament times, there's a difference between the way the Jews saw things in the world and thought about God and answered theological and philosophical questions. There's a difference between how the Jews handled information and the Greeks. And so the word truth to a Greek has to do with facts. You line up, you get your ducks in a row, you get the facts right. That's the Greek idea, and we're Greeks about that. We, wanna, we want the truth and nothing but the truth. Well, to the Hebrews, the word truth also meant faithfulness, dependability, loyalty, being true to somebody. Y'all get it? That word truth down there that I put versus betrayal is the idea that those who go against God's plan are betraying God. And those who go along, Jesus said, teaching them to observe all the things that I have commanded you. And when we do that, we are living in truth. We are living in loyalty. We're living in faithfulness to the faithful God. And ultimately, it's a question of life versus death. Jesus could have brought the kingdom, uh, according to these temptations, by bringing death to those he didn't like and those that wanted to oppose him. Is that the way he did it? 
No, he let them kill him. That's different. You talk about the world turned upside down. The expectation of the Jews that were worried about whether or not John was the Messiah, then they worried about whether Jesus was the Messiah. They couldn't understand the world being up, turned upside down. And John says that when he and Peter went to that empty tomb, they didn't believe it either until then. Matthew chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. The tempter came to him and said, If you're the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. How you like that word, if? That's not a very big word, is it? But it sure is a big one there. If. And Jesus answered, It is written. <laughs> oh boy, what? How important is a phrase like that? Well, there's a lot of things written these days. Um, Y'all seen any of it that's not worth a hoot? Yeah, there are some things that are, written, that are written that matter, and there's some things that don't matter. But Jesus said, It is written that man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Well, that every word that comes from the mouth of God, I've emphasized that the word of God comes to us in more than a written form. And he's talking about the written word right there, but he's also talking about that what came from the mouth of God. To misuse God's power is to violate God's trust and his word. And here is a quote from Exodus 23 and 25, worship the Lord your God. And he will bless your bread and your water. I will remove illnesses from you. This is the Lord's promise to Israel. God did not send his son in order to keep him from perishing from starvation. He sent his son that it's us that would not perish. Jesus did perish for three days. But God didn't have to save Jesus from perishing from starvation. That wasn't the plan. John 10.10 10, Jesus talked about his commission from God. And he said, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. That's bringing the kingdom from the top down. That's Satan's way. I have come that they may have life and have it in all its fullness. I think the King James says, in more abundance. Well, that word abundance can be misconstrued and has been in this way. Do y'all, have y'all ever heard of a nation in this world that had the abundance that we now have? Now, if that's so, are, uh, are we a nation that's honoring God and turning to Jesus for instructions or is that who we are? Well, to have life and to have it in all of its fullness means that we have peace with God. And there's an awful lot of people around us that don't know what peace is. And we have got a division going in the country because we don't know what peace is. Jesus came. He's the prince of peace, not the prince of war not the prince of racial hatred and division and arguments and so forth. He said, you can have life in its fullness in him. Matthew 4, 5, and 7. They talked about the command of angels or an angel army. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. I'm going to show you something and come back to this. 
This is the Jerusalem model in Jerusalem. And the archaeologists have combined their knowledge and they have created a temple model that's based on what we know. And so where would you say in that model that the pinnacle of the temple is, the highest point where Satan took him up there and said, if you jump off from here, then the angel will save you. Where would that be? Well, if that is an accurate temple model, and that's the best we can do, I think, um, I doubt, see that right there is the actual temple. This is the temple mount that still exists. The Romans destroyed all of this down to the floor in 70 AD, and it's been partially rebuilt as, as that's a mosque and that's a mosque. Uh, I'll show you that picture. There's a picture I made from Enrogel or the Akeldama. What in the world are you talking about, boy? Enrogel is the second spring. Gihon is up there where the greenery is uh, outside the wall of Jerusalem. And Enrogel, the other water source, is down here where these trees are. And the Akeldama is over here to my left. That's the field of blood that Judas purchased with the blood money. Well, that is the view from down there of the actual Temple Mount. And you're looking at the El Aqsa Mosque right there. So, was that the pinnacle of the temple? Is that the highest place where Satan took him? There it is right there. I don't know where it was. It's either there or there or there, in my opinion. And probably that corner right there. Now, back to the scripture. He took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written. There's it, there it is, it's been written. And he's quoting it. He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Well, the devil is going to save Jesus from being injured. He's going to save him from being whipped and spit on and so forth. And Jesus answered. By the way, that was Psalm 91, 11, and 12 that Satan quoted. And Jesus answered from Deuteronomy 6.16. 6, it's also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Well, uh, y'all know what that is? Every time we get out of line with God, we are putting him to the test. We're actually ask, asking for some angel to come give us a what that we'll never forget every time we get out of line with God we're asking to be punished that's testing God now I'll say this and these are my notes and I don't know why they appeared in red down there because uh, I think it's because I had red up there on, on the words of Jesus but you cannot hold God or his work as a hostage Anybody that thinks that God's work is theirs is holding it away from God as a hostage. You cannot rub the glory of God all over yourself. You have to, you have to be humble before God. And Satan is telling Jesus that you can own God's work. Well, I've also got a note there that we were given prayer as a privilege. Prayer is a privilege given by God. It is not your weapon. We have to ask God in prayer. We cannot tell God or manipulate God. Be careful what you say when you pray in public or in private. And that is get away from telling God a bunch of stuff. 
The scripture says he knows what you need. I don't know exactly how to tell you to pray. Jesus gave an example in there. But I'm just telling you that prayer is not to be a manipulation of God. And that's exactly what Satan tried to get Jesus to do. And there's a temple. Matthew 4, 8 through 11. About serving God. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you if you will bow down and worship me. How about that? Is it written that Satan can do that? I'm not sure that that's been written. No. No. And so Jesus quoted Deuteronomy 6, 13. That's been written. Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And then the devil left him and angels came and attended him. Now I've made the statement to you that as a teacher that's got a few years of experience and I've had some pretty good training by some folks that knew what they were talking about in the Lord. And I had a professor that got it across to me that all idolatry is self-indulgence. Now, when we turn the church into a place of self-indulgence, we kind of turn the church into an idol. I'm not saying that we ought to come down here and, and uh, be hold a funeral every Sunday or make it so serious that the young people are all turned away. Everybody knows that everybody wants to have a good time. But man has a tendency to want to create God in his own image. That's what the sin was in the Garden of Eden. They thought that they could make themselves a God. Well, why do people make gods? Well, when man becomes the creator God instead of God, then man makes the rules, doesn't he? Jesus said, teach them what I have commanded. He didn't say, teach them what some of y'all have commanded. Why did they crucify Jesus? Well, he broke some of their laws. Oh, he was a sinner. I mean, he did things. I mean, your disciples are picking grain on Shabbat. Why, you can't do that. Our law says you can't do that. And Jesus said, oh, yes, we can. And it's in your book an example. Don't you see it? Well, we have a way of making more rules than God told us we ought to make. And when we do that, we're worshiping ourselves. Now, I have tried to emphasize in the way I teach that the church people are the people of God and we're either partners with God or we're on our own. How many churches have you seen that got off on their own and they're gone or going? How many children have we raised in our churches and we didn't teach them how to be partners with God. And they're gone. Matthew 3 and Matthew 4. Matthew 3, 1 and 2. And Matthew 4, 17. And this is John and Jesus. And the word repent is a common word. In the third chapter of Matthew, John the Baptist is introduced in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. And then in the fourth chapter, from that time on, Jesus began to preach, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. For John and Jesus had that in common. We ought to pay attention to that as important. And so what is repent? Remember, it's a horseman's turn. 
The man on the horse turns the horse's head and the whole horse goes where the head points. And when we repent of our sins, we turn from sin to God and a life of service as God's partner in Jesus. Matthew 4. I've been over this before, but I'm emphasizing here the partners. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, Peter, and his brother, Andrew, and they were casting a net in the lake for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. And at once they left their nets and followed him. Well, I believe that they had heard Jesus talking about repentance. I don't think this just happened without anybody knowing anybody. These are partners. Brothers are partners. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers. James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John. And they were in a boat with their father, Zebedee, preparing their nets. And Jesus called them and immediately left the boat and their father and followed him. Jesus made them partners right there. And the point I'll make with you is that they were already partners with each other. And he just said, come on, we'll work together. This is a partnership with Jesus, the Son of God. So in Matthew 4, 23 to 25, you have a report of the spread of the good news. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. Now, why was he doing that? That question has been raised down through the centuries, and I say he did it because he cared. He did it because of the love of God. He did not do it to show off. And, and, and when I get time, I mean, I can't tell you everything that's in this book in one night, can I? I mean, I probably don't know everything that's in the book if I had the time. But I'm doing what I can. But I'm going to come to the point where we discuss why Jesus used miracles. And I'm saying he used them because he cared not to show off. News about him spread all over Syria. Y'all know how big that is? Well, I'm going to show you on the map here in a minute. And people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon-possessed, those having seizures, and the paralyzed, and he healed them. Well, there's not another man on earth that could battle those things but one. And so he did it. Large crowds from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and the region across the Jordan followed him. Now, I think that I have a duty to also teach y'all Bible background as well as the scriptures and the theology behind it. So I'm going to show you some background here. There is a map of the Holy Land. You see this area right here that says the Decapolis? I'm going to show you some pictures of the cities of the Decapolis. This is Galilee, of course, and Nazareth is right there. The Lake of Galilee is there. Bethsaida is right up there where that hand is. You see that? And all these places that they mentioned are right around here. Here's Jerusalem down here. Down here at the lower Jordan is where John was baptizing, and they think where Jesus was tempted in the, in the wilderness. When I was a little boy, my daddy had a church in Kentucky near the seminary, and he took me out to some people's house to eat dinner one time, and I was just a little kid, about five years old. And we were out in the woods, like there's hardly any woods in, that, that exist anymore like them. But my daddy said, that's the wilderness. And I, I still remember the tone in his voice. The wilderness. Well, the wilderness where Jesus was wasn't like the wilderness of Kentucky. There's nothing growing in that wilderness. That's why Jesus was hungry. 
And that's why I needed a drink of water. Here are the 10 cities of the Decapolis. What was the Decapolis? Every army has these veterans that want something out of what they did. In our army, we give them a retirement, pay them a pension, and uh, treat them one way or another with the VA and give them free hospitalization and so forth. We also give them medals and honor, and there's all kinds of ways that you reward the veterans. Well, in those days, they gave them land or territory or cities. And so these, the Decapolis were 10 Greek cities amongst the Jews. And this first one here, Scythopolis, is the only one of these that's in Israel proper. And in the Bible, it's called beth -Jan. It's in Israel. And, and probably the way that they got to be Greek cities is that Alexander, who took this country, by the way, with his army, his vets were settled in these cities. And when Pompey took over the Holy Land in 63 B.C., well, here were these well-governed Greek cultured cities amongst the Jews, and Pompey said, well, well, we'll give you guys some privileges. And so they gave them legal standing in the empire, and that's the Decapolis. Well, you see the green there, that's the Decapolis. All right, now, you see this where my cursor is? That is Bethshan, or Scythopolis. Decapolis, by the way, De Deca is the word that means tent. And polis is the word for city. I mean, we got cities in the United States named like that. Y'all ever heard of Indianapolis? Mm -hmm. Well, that's the city of the Indian country. And this is Scythopolis, or Bethshan. And then I'm going to show you pictures from, from one more. And that's Jerasa. You see it over here in the, in the desert of Jordan. There's another city down here you've heard of, Philadelphia. Well, that's Amman, Jordan, today. This is the other side of the Jordan, right there on, on your right. And on your left is Israel. This is what you would see on those roads. And I meant to point out the roads. Let me go back to it. Y'all see those lines? Those black lines on that map? That's interstate highways. That's the trade routes where the caravans and the travelers and the armies travel. Do you see Nazareth on this map? right there you see it one of those trade routes and, and in the top of the map you can't see it but damascus is up there and they come off of that desert from the euphrates river into damascus and these roads come from damascus and one of them leads right down through nazareth where jesus grew up and and increased in stature with god and man and he could see this Here's what he could see. Jesus had seen armies. This is the Roman army. And I guarantee you, they made their presence felt. And where they went, nobody argued. Here's a picture of the Roman army on the road. Y'all see all that organization and those troops? When, that, when one legion of that army took the road, it took up 15 kilometers of road, solid, troops and equipment. Jesus had seen that. Here's one of their wagons that they travel the roads with. Here's something else Jesus would have seen, and that's uh, the caravan people. They, they were doing it then, they're doing it now. I have run out of time, and you have been patient. And you can see where I'm going to take this up next week, can't you?
Thank you for your patience. You're dismissed.